Hi there. Thank you very much for joining me in this video, the first in a series of videos teaching the absolute beginner the Welsh language. So, as mentioned in the title, this course is for the absolute beginner. So if you know absolutely nothing about the Welsh language, you are ideally suited to begin studying this course. And to do so, you don't need anything other than something to write with and something to write on. But before we begin, I just need to explain what makes this course unique. Because if one looks at the title of this lesson, it says Introduction, General Welsh Grammar and Pronunciation. So what exactly is meant by the term General Welsh Grammar and Pronunciation? Well, nowadays if one were to walk into a bookshop in the year 2022 and to look for a book teaching the Welsh language, one would most likely find one that taught the Welsh language as two distinct dialects, the Northern and the Southern. And I think the reason for this dichotomy is that these books aim to get the reader up to speed as quickly as possible with their colloquial language, as spoken in the town, cities and streets of the northern and southern regions of Wales, which is not too dissimilar to the differences between the northern and southern English where, for example, in the south people say bath, and in the north they say bath, and in the south they say path, and in the north they say path, and such like. I've been learning Welsh for decades, and I've been buying these books on and off over the years, and what I tend to find is that normally they would tend to include in the same section a paragraph on the northern pronunciation and grammar, and then the equivalent in the southern dialect, and then perhaps the equivalent in the historic traditional dialect as well. So that's one format which is quite preponderant. Another format is that one book is purely in the northern dialect, and you have the equivalent same book in the purely southern dialect. And over the years, I've come to the opinion that I found this way of doing things slightly overcomplicated and unnecessary and that actually there is only one correct Welsh language which is the general traditional Welsh language which has remained static and unchanged for the most part from around the 17th century right through to the 18th and 19th centuries but that since the post-war period there has been this trend to modernize the language and to simplify it and to make it more like the colloquial language that is actually spoken on a daily basis in the town streets and cities in North and South Wales, which is commendable if it works in terms of getting absolute beginners up to speed as quickly as possible and sounding like fluent speakers speaking a distinct local dialect as quickly as possible. But if one wants to learn the Welsh language in order to appreciate the Welsh literary culture, particularly of the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, then possibly it would be more useful to learn the traditional general Welsh grammar and pronunciation. So this is the course that I have devised following my experience in learning the Welsh language through different approaches. Personally, I find it more advantageous to learn the general traditional Welsh grammar and pronunciation for several reasons. The first being that the Welsh language, like any other living language, is a vast language that has developed through centuries and millennia, and there are many, many different ways of saying the same thing, and many different ways of pronouncing the same words in the many different regions of Wales. But if one learns the traditional, general language, then one gets an understanding of how the modern differences have evolved out of the common general language and the things that one learns in the general language are nevertheless applicable in both the northern and the southern dialects. Then one gets an understanding of how the modern differences have evolved out of the common general language and the things that one learns in the general language are nevertheless applicable in both the northern and the southern dialects. For example, if one takes the case of the word livre, which means books, L-Y-F-R-A-U, 
according to the phonetics of the traditional general Welsh pronunciation, the vowel Y is pronounced as a, uh, and the vowel A is pronounced as R, and the vowel U is pronounced as I, which itself evolved from the ancient pronunciation of EU for the letter U. Therefore, according to the strict interpretation of the rules of pronunciation in the general Welsh language, it's Lavraia, 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 Lavraia. However, in the northern pronunciation, it's evolved to Lavra, which means that they've dropped the Lavra I at the end. The Lavra I has become Lavra, whereas in the south, it's become Lavrai, Lavrai, Lavre, Lavre. So my hypothesis as regards how these differences came about is that generally in the Bretonic language, which includes Cornish and as well, I don't know much about Breton, but to me it sounds like Breton is heavily influenced by the French phonetics, but I could be wrong. But certainly for medieval Cornish, vowels tend to mutate to a more open sound if the speaker wishes to display a warmer or more heartfelt feeling in the expression. In English, it would be like saying, instead of hello, it would be like, hello. We say hello instead of hello if we want to be warmer. So I have a theory that in the olden days, in the north, they tended to be a much more close-knit, and with a more close-knit society, the community tend to speak to each other in a more heartfelt and warmer form of way. So instead of saying lovrai, they might say lovra, because that's a broader vowel sound, lovra, than lovrai. So that's my theory. As regards the South, I think it's pretty likely that if you're saying lovrai, then lovre, lovre is the much quicker way of saying things. So that's it's just abbreviation of lovrai. So with the North pronouncing the word L-Y-F-R-A-U as lovra, and the South pronouncing it as lovre, if I were to say the word lovrai, it wouldn't be incorrect in either the northern or the southern dialect. It would just sound very formal, very old-fashioned, and slightly unapproachable. But that is a nature of a language that is not the colloquial language. But if, as a beginner, one were to learn it as levrai, then one would understand that it's shortened or abbreviated to levra in certain parts, and in others it's abbreviated to, to levre. And that not only is something that is quite easy to do and easy to learn, but also it gives a better understanding of how and why it's pronounced Lavra in the north and Lavre in the south. And as well as that, it makes things so much easier for the beginner, because both forms are used all the time in the Welsh media. So that is an example of differences in pronunciation. But as well as that, we also have differences in the usage of words. For example, the Welsh word for with is commonly used as a set phrase in many different contexts. For example, if one wished to say sorry in Welsh, one could say amhirade, which translates literally as apologies. One could also use the set phrase that includes the word for with, such as my vlin gadavi, means literally there is weariness with me. So that is spoken in the south with the usage of the word gada. But in the north, one could say my vlin gandavi, which means the same. But actually, the two words gada and gan do not exactly mean the same thing. Gada is derived from the two words kid and ah, which has the nuance of meaning by the side of something whereas gan is the immediate traditional Welsh word for with. But in the colloquial language, what happens is that it is the language of the community, where the people of a specific area tend to speak and talk like each other. Therefore, we end up having a form of the language that is a narrow form of the overall literary language. So if one were to use the two words gada and gan in the context of the literary language, this would be wholly correct, because they both come from the literary language, 
that is to say, from the traditional language used in earlier periods. And therefore, if one were to use, let's say, the word gada in an area where the word garn is used instead, that wouldn't be incorrect either. It would just be unusual and show to others that you are an outsider. And similarly, with the word garn, if one were to use the word garn in a context where one would use gada in such an area, it wouldn't be incorrect either. So basically, these are like the words pavement and sidewalk in UK and US English. If one were to use the word pavement in a US context, this wouldn't be incorrect, but it would be unusual. And similarly, if one were to use the word sidewalk in UK English, it wouldn't be incorrect, but it would be unusual as well. But in the context of someone learning the English language, that person needs to know what both words sidewalk and pavement mean, and how they should be used. And now moving on. Another thing I found in these modern textbooks is the, abbrevi is the abbreviated form of, for example, the declension of verbs. Therefore, one finds the Welsh word for the imperfect tense of I was, roedhwn, abbreviated to ron, and similarly, you were, singular, roedhet, abbreviated to rot. And in some of these books, in a separate paragraph, they give the common traditional form, that is, roedhwn and roedhet, but they teach that the modern abbreviated form is ron rot, but some others don't do that. I take the view that if one were to learn just the original traditional form, that is to say roedhwn and roedhet, then it's pretty obvious to me in normal conversation these are abbreviated to ron rot and so on, in the same way that is not is abbreviated to isn't, and then to ain't, in normal, fast, colloquial speech. But if, as a beginner, one were simply just to learn ain't, for example, and not to be aware of is not, then I think this way of learning is harder and more difficult than learning the original is not, and then learning the abbreviation afterwards. So this is what this course does. It teaches the original long traditional forms of verbs, but one needs to realise that in normal fast conversation, these forms are abbreviated, as would be their equivalent forms in English as well. Another advantage of the traditional general Welsh form is that it makes the literature prior to the 1900s a lot more accessible. Just to give a very brief overview of the background of Welsh orthography or spelling, the Welsh spelling system it's very consistent. Each of the letters of the vowels and the consonants have a very precise pronunciation, and the reason why that is is because the Welsh spelling system itself dates from the time of the Roman colonisation of Britain, which makes Welsh, after the Romance languages, one of the earliest literary languages of Europe. And unlike English, which is heavily influenced by Norman French in its grammar, pronunciation and vocabulary, through the centuries following the Roman colonization of Britain, the Welsh language has remained very much a purely Celtic Brythonic language. In terms of the spelling system, from the end of the Roman colonization right up to the Middle Ages, the ancient Roman alphabet was used, together with the latest development on the continent of Europe in terms of changes of pronunciation. Therefore, by the time we get to someone like David Ab Gwilym, who is regarded as one of the greatest Welsh poets of the medieval period, we have the usage of the letter K, because the influence of the Germanic languages have caused the languages on the continent of Europe to start pronouncing the letter C with a soft sound, as in the word ceiling in English, which comes from the French ciel, and so forth. The same reason as why the English language uses the letter K. 
And as well as that, in medieval Welsh, we had the letter V, which itself directly comes from the ancient Roman letter V, pronounced with a sound U. But as well as that, we had the letter U, which very early on was distinguished from the letter V by its pronunciation with the sound EU. And as well as that, the letter H was used after the C to denote a hard C sound, the same as the letter K. So we had all sorts of different letters, some of them extremely ancient, some of them not so ancient, in the medieval Welsh alphabet, so that by the time we got to the Renaissance Tudor period, with the arrival of publication, there was an effort to streamline and simplify the spelling system. The softening of the C that heavily affected English and the Romance and Germanic languages on the continent never really impacted on the ancient Brythonic Welsh. Therefore, the word, for example, canis in Latin, which became chien in French, remained as an initial hard C sound in the word key in Welsh, and the Latin word cellula became the French word cellule, which became the English word cell, but remained with a hard C sound in the Welsh word cell. Therefore, in the standardization of Welsh spelling, the letters K and CH were converted back to the letter C, and for reasons of simplification, the letter V with the U sound became the letter W, and through the course of time, the pronunciation of the letter U, that was U initially, became abbreviated and abbreviated to E. So that in the northern dialect today, we have the pronunciation E, and in the southern dialect, we have the pronunciation E, which is very similar to the pronunciation of the letter I, as in E. But nevertheless, these are still two very different letters with two distinct sounds. Therefore, thanks to the work of William Morgan, the Bishop of Landarf and St. Asaph, the Welsh spelling system became standardised and remained largely static from the year 1588 onwards, right through the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. With the flourishing of Welsh literature in the forms of poetry and novels and essays and articles and encyclopedias from writers such as Beria Gwynfe Evans, who was an important novelist and dramatist, the author of novels such as Gwadis Griffith and Davis Davis, and also the play Owain Glendur, and as well as Beria Gwynfe Evans, we also have the poetess Sarah Jane Rees, known more popularly by the bardic name of Cranogwen, who produced the important collection of poems known as Kanyade, Cranogwen. By the time we got to the period leading up to and after the First World War, there was a great international movement to make literature reflect the language of the ordinary people. For example, we see this happening in the novels of Mark Twain and D. H. Lawrence, where they use the spellings of words that accurately reflect the colloquial pronunciation as spoken by the characters in their novels. And this was a movement that influenced Welsh literature, so much so that in the period after the Second World War, in the passages where we get the quoted speech of the characters in the novels, these are almost always written in the local, quilocal, regional dialect, rather than in the standardised general Welsh form. And when one watches a drama, whether it is on the TV, or in the theatre, or listen to it on the radio, 
These are almost always spoken in the regional dialect form, and hardly ever in the standardized general form. But of course, when one watches a TV documentary or a news program, or listen to a, a news item on the radio, these take the more standardized general form, with the regional variations in pronunciation, as already mentioned above. Therefore, perhaps because of the preponderance of the usage of regional dialect forms in the Welsh language. This is the reason why they are so commonly taught in the textbooks that we find on the shelves today. Another advantage for the beginner of learning the general Welsh form to start off with is that in any case, when we get to the more advanced level, as fluent speakers, we need to understand both the northern and the southern dialects, similar to the case as in English, with both the US and the UK forms of English. Therefore, if, as beginners, we have a grounding in the standardized general traditional form of pronunciation and grammar, then, as mentioned already, we can simply treat the regional to local forms as abbreviations of the standardized traditional forms. And as well as that, another advantage is that what I found when I was using these textbooks was that when I was watching, let's say, a drama in Welsh or listening to someone on the radio, because I was being taught the differences in the north and the south, I was always conscious of the differences and always trying to pigeonhole the language into either north or south, which I think makes understanding the language slightly harder because one is faced with the decision, am I a northern speaker or a southern speaker? And if I am learning a southern Welsh dialect, do I need to listen to the northern Welsh dialect when it's being spoken? Or if I'm a beginner learning the northern Welsh dialect, do I need to listen to the southern Welsh dialect? My answer to these questions now would be yes. If one is learning Welsh as a beginner or as any level, one needs to listen to as much Welsh as possible, regardless of whether it's northern or southern. And even if the words that are being said are abbreviated in different ways from some kind of standard form that used to exist in the past, as learners of the language who are wishing and looking to understand Welsh literature, not just of the modern period, but also of the past, we need to understand the traditional forms as well as the modern abbreviations. And so if at the level of the beginner we learn these standard forms, then it avoids pigeonholing language into regions and it makes us focus more on the language rather than on categorizing the language. So I think that is a major advantage of learning a single general Welsh at the level of the beginner. So we've talked about the advantages of a common general Welsh form for the beginner. But what about the disadvantages? Well, as mentioned before, the first disadvantage is that a lot of coded speech in recent literature and drama is written in dialect. But having said this, same as in English, if one had a general understanding of the standard general language, it's not difficult to understand how the dialect forms came to being. They are just basically abbreviations of the standard form. And secondly, if one learns the general standard language as a beginner, it makes the learner's speech less rooted in either the north or south. But I don't think this is much of an issue because if one were a beginner at the basic level, one would in any case sound like a beginner, regardless of whatever dialect one is learning. If one is not looking to understand the literature from the past of the Welsh language, then I do take the point that if one wants purely to get up to speed in speaking the local dialect, and nothing else but that, then maybe, yes, they should just learn the local dialect, because very often the local dialect is 
easier and simpler to learn than the literary language. But if one wants to become a fluent speaker in Welsh and converse in Welsh across the board in all kinds of different contexts and environments, then sooner or later one will need to learn the other dialects and one will need to learn the standard traditional form. So if this is the case, why not begin sooner rather than later? Another disadvantage is that when one learns the formal literary language, it can make the speech sound more formal and unapproachable. But once again, with regards to the case of a beginner, I think this is hardly an issue because it is clear that the beginner is at the early stages of learning the language and sooner or later, as a learner, one generally tends to pick up the accent from the locality where one lives. So what I find is that, from my experience, because I live in South Wales, I find myself unconsciously, when I'm watching the TV or listening to the radio, always listening out for someone speaking from my area. So that is subconscious and unconscious. And because of that, I find myself unconsciously speaking more and more like the dialect of South Wales. And I think the same holds true for any other speaker anywhere else in Wales. If you are a beginner learning to speak Welsh in North Wales, you probably find yourself listening out for the North Wales dialect in the media, on the TV and on the radio, and subconsciously trying to emulate that dialect. And sooner or later, as you advance in your ability to speak Welsh, you'll most likely find yourself speaking more and more like a North Walian. So this is the final point that I wish to make in this first lesson, the introduction. That in this course, even though it aims to teach the general common standard Welsh that is valid across all regions of Wales, and the Welsh language does not only have the two dialects, northern and southern, in amongst the northern and southern there are also the subdivisions of the sub-dialects. There are the differences between the northeastern and the northwestern dialects, and in the south there are the differences between the dialects in the valleys, in Swansea, in Carmarthen and Pembroke, and also the Cardiff dialect is slightly distinct as well. And as well as that, the areas surrounding Cardiff, like Pontypris and Carfilly, they both have their own distinct accents. Therefore, with regards to accents and dialect and the importance with which one should place them at the level of the beginner, I would say that one shouldn't really worry about the dialect at this level at the moment, because the local dialect is something that one will pick up, I would say, eventually, sooner or later. And it's a process that happens subconsciously. Therefore, this is all I would like to say for this first lesson. We are at the very start of the journey in learning how to speak Welsh. I do look forward very much to speaking to you once again in the next lesson. Thank you very much for joining me in this one. I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. Until next time, keep safe and keep well, and have a nice day. Or, as they say in Welsh, Tanatro Nesov, Kadukhsov Akanyach, Ahuel.